Good evening. This is Good Friday. It's our time to gather as the church to um, bear witness to the sacrifice of our Lord for us. All that he did was for us. Tonight, I welcome you to this worship, you who are from Christ Lutheran Church in Athens, Ohio, and others who might be watching too, invited by the congregation. Tonight, we see life and death standing side by side as we begin this Good Friday. In John's Passion account, which we'll hear tonight, Jesus reveals the power and the glory of God, even as our Lord is put on trial and sentenced to death. Standing with the disciples at the foot of the cross, we pray for the whole world in that ancient bidding prayer of the church as Christ's death offers life to us all. At the end of our worship service tonight, we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. There is no benediction tonight, indicating that this service is one in continuity with our Easter celebration. We begin our worship tonight in prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, your Son was lifted up on the cross to draw all people to himself. Grant that we who have been born out of his wounded side may at all times find mercy in him, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I encourage you to take a little bit of time at the beginning of our worship service tonight to set up a, a place of worship for yourself and those who are with you. Uh, you might want to light a little candle, a reminder of our Lord's presence with us always. and. Uh, if you have a Bible handy uh, now or later, you might want to look up those scripture readings appointed to be read tonight. First reading, the Old Testament reading, is from Isaiah chapter 52, beginning at verse 13 and continuing all the way through chapter 53, verse 12. The psalm tonight is a traditional reading of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our epistle reading tonight is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, and then concluding with chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. And finally, the gospel reading tonight, which I'll be reading in place of the sermon, is from John's gospel, John chapter 18, beginning at the first verse and concluding the end of chapter 19. As we begin our reflection tonight, I'd like to read that Hebrews passage. It's not very long, but I'd like to read it as an introduction to our worship. So bear witness to these words from Hebrews chapter 4 and chapter 5. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Powerful reading from Hebrews describing in a nutshell, what this is all. Now tonight, I invite you to join me as we read together uh, our gospel reading, the Passion Narrative, from our Lord's arrest to his burial. Uh, I'll have five very brief reflections interspersed in the reading. <clears throat> Again, if you'd like to follow along, it begins at John chapter 18, verse 1. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden where, which he and his disciples entered. 
Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you seeking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And then he asked them, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of, whom, of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, struck it, drew it, struck the high priest slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup? that the Father has given me. Betrayal, such an ugly word. If you've ever been betrayed by a friend or a loved one, you know the pain. And if you've been on the betraying end, if you have betrayed someone else, perhaps to make your life a little more comfortable, to spare you some pain or suffering, you realize now what pain and suffering that caused for you betrayed. Jesus had wrapped his arms around these disciples, had loved them completely, had welcomed them into his heart and into the heart of the Father. And now, when he needed them most, they turned, they betrayed, they fled. Is there hope for those who betray our Lord? Yes, yes, there is. No matter how bad the betrayals, that you have suffered. I invite you to hear what Jesus says to you. You are loved, you are forgiven. So the soldiers, their officer and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that, that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you testify to the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, 
You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. At that moment, the cock crowed. Denial is its own form of betrayal. But what I would call you to your attention in this section of the reading is how Jesus was taken from one person to another. Taken from one person to another, presumably because that way the blame could be shared, the responsibility shared with more than just one. It's a coward's way out, isn't it? But how often it's easier to be a coward, than to be courageous. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? That's a tough question, isn't it? What is truth? We live in an age in which truth is oftentimes a rare commodity. Truth is something that is hard to discern with all the forces, all the voices out there speaking to us, claiming to be telling the truth. I can understand, and I think you can too, why Pilate asked Jesus that question. What is the truth? What, what is the truth? What is God's truth? What is man's truth? Are they the same? Are they in conflict? What is the truth? After Pilate had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But do you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover? Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was demanded. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wore, wore, wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. 
When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed, handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbath. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. One gets the impression in hearing and reading this account that while Pilate was doing his best to release Jesus, because he could find no guilt in this man. The crowd was insistent. They knew exactly what they wanted. They felt threatened. And Jesus, they felt, was the source of what might threaten their power and their future. Caiaphas had said, isn't it better that one man die for the nation? Expediency was big then and is big now. What is best? That we kill one person? That we destroy the lives of others? That the privileged might survive? We struggle with that. The authorities in Jerusalem didn't care that strong when it came to Jesus. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother 
and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up. I'm continually amazed by the details of this account. Details about wine on a hyssop branch, about all the things that were said and done, and how they were in fulfillment of what the scriptures had told. John is very concerned in placing this life-changing event, the death of Jesus, into a context where every detail was caught, almost as if it were recorded on video. We think about this, we think about the details, we look at the details of our own lives. Take a moment and consider some of the important details of your life. My guess is that many of those details have kind of evaded you or are lost to history because they just didn't seem that important. These details are shared with us by John that we might know that everything that happened was done in fulfillment to them. Since it was the day of preparation for the Passover, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. And then a parenthetical note here inserted by John, he who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones will be broken. And again, again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, although a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus. This story, this account, is so painful to hear. We hear it every year because it's a reminder for us of the real sacrifice of Jesus, his real death. For his resurrection would not be real unless there was really. 
contemplating this, I invite you now to join me in the bidding prayer, the traditional bidding prayer for the Catholic. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the church, the holy church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, abide now the church. Gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, our pastors, other ministers and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith, and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray now for all those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and the oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority, to the president, to Congress, to the courts of this nation, so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all who are in any need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, Lord, especially those who suffer the effects of the coronavirus that is now spreading throughout the world. Comfort the dying and those who grieve for them. Give safety to travelers. Free those unjustly deprived of liberty and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And finally, let us conclude our worship this evening as we pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. 
using the prayer which our Lord has taught us. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On Holy Saturday, the church stands vigil as we await the joy of the resurrection on Easter morning. I invite you tomorrow on Saturday to take some time in your busy day to simply pray for those concerns that are near and dear to you, those people that are precious to you, those people that are precious to the Lord. Remember them in prayer. Pray for our church. Pray for Christ Lutheran as, they, as you continue through this process of calling a new pastor. And uh, certainly pray for our world as we struggle with this coronavirus. And now again, no benediction tonight, but I, but I bid you farewell, and I look forward to seeing you again on Easter morning. God bless you.